Hello, everyone, and welcome to the future of space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Pete Warden. He is the chairman of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation and executive director of the foundation's Breakthrough Initiatives. Prior to joining the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, Pete was director of NASA's Amy's Research Center. He is a recognized expert on space and science issues and has been a leader in building partnerships between the governments and the private sectors internationally. He has served as a scientific, uh, scientific co-investigator for three NASA space science missions, most recently the Interface Region Imagine Spectrograph launch in 2013 to study the sun. Pete, it is so nice to have you on the future of space. Well, thank you, Daniel. I'm uh, happy to be here. All right, before we get into your background and what you're working on with the Breakthrough Foundation, can you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? Sure, uh, infinite, eternal adventure. Talking about adventure, if you have the, the, the um, opportunity of going to space, will you, will you take it? Absolutely. I, I would in an instant. <laughs> so the flight, but also going to the moon? Yeah, going to the moon, going beyond uh, any place in space I'd go. Excellent. Excellent. So we know that space, there's a, there's a science story of going to space, there's technology. Um, but what is for you the human story and why, why will it benefit the human species and also the earth um, going to space? Well, I think the, uh, the most important thing to understand is space uh, is, is different things to different people. And, and I sort of like to use a, an analogy that, uh, that an old friend of mine, Rick Tumlinson did uh, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, he, he gave three justifications and I'm going to add a fourth one, which I think is better, uh, or at least to me more important. The first one is, uh, is about uh, national power and national influence. And, and of course he named that after Werner von Braun and, uh, that's a significant reason. And, uh, the second uh, justification, which I think is, is foremost for a number of people, is science, the, the search for knowledge. Uh, he named that one after uh, Carl Sagan. Uh, the third one is about bettering the human condition, that, that, that by using space and by living in space, that we can have you know, a, a better life. Uh, and that's, uh, he named after that one after Jerry O'Neill, who talked about space colonies. Well, I think that uh, the, for me, the best reason is, is the three words I gave you at the beginning. It's about the, the human spirit. It's about an unlimited adventure. Uh, and I named that after Arthur C. Clarke, who was a mentor of mine and a friend. And I think if you read uh, Arthur's uh, writings, you see that as a key part. So I, I think that, that we've sort of run out of places to... to to really have an adventure that is, is really inspires your soul. And, and space offers that uh, uh, unlimited in, 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 uh, in time and space. Do you think that from the perspective of life, it was never, it never wanted to be limited to just one planet, like for the same reason that it went from single cell to multi-cell and evolution kind of took a quantum leap at that moment. Now we're about to go from single planet to multi-planetary and if life if the the principles of life on earth is to connect then it shouldn't be different on the universe level life also wants to connect with other life spots and now we're about to take that life and and go and and try to connect with with other life sources in the universe do you think a life actually wants to go to space well i think it's an imperative of life that you know whatever made us and made life and uh, chemistry or, or others, other things, spiritual dimensions, uh, there is an imperative to, to expand into other, other locations. Uh, I, I sort of like, uh, you know, uh, Edwin Schrodinger, the sort of famous quantum physicist, uh, wrote what's still one of the best uh, d discussions of, of what is life. It was in the, it was in the early 1940s. And, and he sort of, now he later corrected himself, but I think he actually had it right, that, 
that life is the universe's answer to entropy, uh, that uh, it, you know, the universe is tending towards disorder and, 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 and uh, less coherence. But life locally and, and in, in a short period of time reverses that entropy. It creates you know, order and, and, and uh, uh, consistency. So yes, I think that, that uh, it is an imperative of, of what we are uh, to, to expand into every available niche. I think that's one of the successes of the human species is to, we actually manage to rise above the unpredictability and the, what I call the constructive chaos of nature. Because before when we were nomads, we were kind of at the mercy of change and nature because we had to follow the weather, we had to follow the food source. And at one point we decided to take control, we settled down and then the, we're able, and every time that we were limited by nature, we found a way to go beyond, whether it's by location, diseases, medicines, now even with obviously reproduction. And now we're about to defy again the limitation of nature by going to space and taking the, the, the chaos of space and making us um, more adaptable to it. So. What do you think? Well, yes, I, you know, it's, it's a, you know, I think it's, it's, it's all of the above that, uh, uh, you, you know, in some sense, the, you know, from my own justification of, of space was, and by the way, I'm interested in going well beyond the solar system. Uh, in fact, I, uh, when I was a young uh, boy, one of the first books my mother gave me was, were two of them. One was called Planets, the other was called Stars. And uh, I thought the planets one were kind of boring and, uh, you know, that because all the planets in the solar system, there's no scary aliens or anything interesting. It's uh, although I think we're going to find there's life elsewhere in our solar system. But I was interested in the stars that uh, because I think there's an unlimited potential there. And again, this is I want to get back to the uh, the the adventure. And uh, I think we will find other life other places. Uh, now, whether it's intelligent is a definition of what intelligence is. Uh, and I'm, uh, I think we're going to find when we do find alien life and even alien intelligence, it's going to be far more alien than we can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree that there's a lot of, I, I do believe that there's a lot of life out there. Now the intelligent life, that's a different question. I mean, it, it takes a, a particular amount of luck and circumstances for intelligence to you know to to come out had it not been for you know the asteroid to kind of come down and create a, a blank canvas after the the dinosaurs most likely there would still be life on earth whether it was an, it's it intelligent or not well that's a different question now i want to circle back to your own journey you've been in you were in nasa now you're working for the foundation and you talked about these uh, mentors, C. Clark, and other inspirational figures in your in your life. But can you share with us a little bit your journey from, you know, the the Pete who just graduated from high school to where you are today? Well, I can even go as I mentioned. I, I was a little boy when I first read these books, and I asked my mother, "Well, what uh, my father? What do people do that study the stars?" And they're called astronomers. So I wanted to be an astronomer, you know you know, ever since I can remember. And uh, uh, when I went to, to high school, uh, you know, I looked around at what college to go to, to, to be a, to go into astronomy. And it, it turned out that, uh, you know, I was lucky that one of the best astronomy schools in the, in the country was the University of Michigan, uh, which I went to, uh, by the way, for other Michigan uh, alumni, go blue. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, when I, it was during the Apollo program, I, I went to Michigan in 1967 and, uh, uh, everybody wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, there was 120 astronomy majors, my uh, freshman year. Uh, it ended up six of us, uh, actually got degrees in astronomy. Most of us discovered that you needed to know math and, and that was, that was a big discriminator. Uh, fortunately I did well in math. And uh, uh, at, in the end, only two of us ended up getting a, a PhD, and I think I'm the only one left still working on it. So it was, a, but it was really the excitement of, of 
both as a, you know, growing up, uh, being excited about astronomy, and then the Apollo program. Uh, uh, my father was a uh, was a was an Air Force pilot, and uh, and uh, you know he wanted me to go to become a pilot to become an astronaut. So uh, these all sort of intertwined, uh, and it uh, I ended up spending 29 years in the Air Force. Uh, I was you know, a, a finalist uh, once for astronaut selection and didn't get selected. So I'm kind of jealous of astronauts like uh, Chris Hadfield and other things. But, but uh, you know, I had a great career otherwise. And uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I think that uh, the, you know, ever since I can remember and that, that this was my motivation, it was uh, it was about going into space. It was about going as far into space as we can. It was about finding if there was life elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was, a, I was a science fiction geek in high school. I used to hide science fiction books in my textbook and, uh, uh, you know, got, got in trouble with the teacher and, and, and uh, one of the teachers made me put the book away. So I spent the rest of the time terrorizing other students and, uh, the, the teacher finally said, okay, why don't you just read the science fiction book? Uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it, and it, and, you know, even today, I mean, I'm 72, uh, uh, you know, the adventure is just beginning. Uh, it's, it's very exciting. Every year is more exciting than the previous. So you work for NASA. You made your way to, to, to NASA. And now you're working for the Breakthrough Foundation. How did that transition go? And what is, exactly are you trying to achieve, what the foundation is trying to achieve um, and the prizes that, it, uh, that it's giving away? Well, let, let me let me start with you know uh, as, as an astronomer, as an optical astronomer, I, I, most of the at least the United States is large observatories are built with uh, private money, and uh, when I got to uh, NASA Ames, uh, you know I was sort of in what the military would call a target rich environment. There were a lot of billionaires around. In fact, right next door to our center was a, a little startup you might have heard of. It's called Google. And uh, I got to know the founders and the and the and then CEO uh, Eric Schmidt pretty well, and and it, it occurred to me that we ought to be able to find uh, uh, some of the exciting things that uh, that we wanted to do and have them funded privately. Uh, I also have, have always been a critic of NASA. I think that NASA spends far too much money, and uh, you know, I mean, it's it's sort of inherent in the government. Uh, and, uh, if we could get to leverage private investment, uh, for philanthropic reasons, we could do wonderful things. So I was always looking for, uh, uh, some billionaires and, uh, it, it turned out I found one, uh, one day the, my, uh, my chief of staff came into my office and she said, you'll never guess, you know, who's here to see you. And I said, no, I probably wouldn't. And she said, well, it's uh, vanity fair. And so I sort of well, you know, am I the best dressed center director? And she says, no, you're kind of near the bottom. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, it, it turned out that, in, in fact, just a few days ago, it, Vanity Fair had their usual event. They, they host the post Oscar party. And uh, the, uh, uh, I've never been invited, I keep hinting, but uh, uh, Yuri Milner, my uh, current primary sponsor, uh, was invited, and, he, and uh, he was motivated by the idea that that he and his colleagues, uh, like the you know, uh, uh, Sergey Brin and, and Mark Zuckerberg, have made billions. In fact, there's been several trillion dollars made in the last few decades based on science discoveries of the uh, century ago. And he feels we ought to inspire uh, uh, the next generation by you know, if you if you look at the list of the most admired people on the planet, very few scientists are in it. Maybe Einstein and possibly uh, 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 Stephen Hawking. Uh, but uh, so he he and his colleagues felt we should have the Oscars of science, and uh, they decided they wanted to have the the ceremony at uh, at, at NASA Ames campus, and and uh, so I agreed to do that. And of course, they they uh, they the old saying is if you're going to have a big party, invite the landlord. And so I was a landlord and I got to know these folks pretty well. And, and I, uh, with, with sort of, uh, you know, malice aforethought, I invited Yuri over to, to see, uh, the Kepler mission, which was 
was is, is probably a lot of the viewers recall is has found many thousands of planets and has basically shown that probably every star system in the galaxy has planets and at least a quarter of them maybe has a planet the size of the earth in a habitable zone and uh, you know so i showed him around and at the end of this i said well i'd i'd like uh, uh, to suggest maybe you might want to sponsor this satellite to look for planets in the Alpha Centauri system. And, and he said, uh, well, I, I want to do that, but he said, I'll also, uh, uh, I want to help you build a, a starship. And I'd almost been fired a year or two before by pushing something called the 100 year starship, which I, I and, a, and, a, and a DARPA program manager, uh, we, we end up spending uh, about a million dollars looking uh, to, to start again, private funded interstellar efforts. Uh, he did get fired and I came pretty close, but uh, Yuri Milner had heard about this. And, and so over the next year, we began to discuss, uh, he said, look, I, I want to not just reward science, uh, I want to do science. And he, so he said he was willing to spend many hundreds of millions to, uh, uh, to look for life in the universe. And, uh, uh, you know, once he started talking to me about, do you know who could uh, maybe run this for me? And I said, me, me. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I told, uh, you know, the NASA lawyers that, uh, that, okay, I'm looking for a new job. And, uh, uh, that was in 2015. Uh, in fact, almost exactly seven years ago, uh, uh I was on the first of April was my first day with the, the breakthrough prize and breakthrough initiatives. Uh, so in addition to the prizes, which uh, I oversee, we, uh, we have the breakthrough initiatives, which are looking at looking for life in the universe. Uh, looking for evidence of intelligent life, uh, looking for evidence of any life, and ultimately, to me, maybe the most exciting, can we send probes interstellar distances? Now, when I recently did a, a keynote presentation about the power of nature, and in it, I mentioned my own theory of why we have life on Earth. And it's not precisely because we have the ingredients of life, but because these ingredients are constantly being mixed by the, 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 the cycle around the earth uh, between the, the day and the night and the seasons, all that creates actually disruptions. It's like making bread where you can have the, the ingredients of making bread on the counter, but you can stare at them for thousands of years and nothing's going to happen. There's no bread. For bread to happen, you need to create disruptions. You have to put these ingredients together. You have to create the rhythm and then you put them in the oven. Do you think that in the science world, we tend sometimes to look at these ingredients, but not at the context and where the, the, I mean, these ingredients are. So if we're looking at life in, in the universe, do we need to look more into these places of disruptions and conflict where these ingredients can be mixed together and where life can emerge? Well, that's a very interesting question. You know, in addition to our, our scientific programs, we have an annual conference every year called Breakthrough Discuss. Uh, for the last two years, unfortunately, we've had to do it just online. Uh, but this year, we're going to, we, in June, we're going to do it in person again. And uh, one of the key questions we've asked is, how did life begin? And uh, where do we look for it? And uh, I'm sort of an iconoclast. And uh, when I, that, you know, most people would give me the discussion that you did that, well, there were pools on the earth that, or underwater vents uh, that where there was this mixture and, 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 and ferment. Uh, I actually uh, tend to believe that, that uh, well, there's an interesting point that, that life showed up on earth within a few hundred years of the earth cooling. Uh, I and some other scientists think that that's not enough time for it to emerge here on Earth. And I will say some very smart scientists disagree with that. Uh, I think that it came from elsewhere. And uh, this is a theory called panspermia. Uh, I think our galaxy is infected with life. And I think we're going to find life everywhere. And uh, I don't know where it originated. Uh, it could have originated in interstellar space. It could have originated on planets. Uh, it could be carried uh, between star systems. We now know there's quite a few uh, uh, interstellar, you know, asteroids going between star systems. Uh, in fact, in 2014, it looks like an interstellar meteor actually hit the Earth, uh, you know, a small one. So we have material that's mixing. And, and so I think the, uh, we're going to find that there's life under the surface on Mars. I think we're going to find there's life in the atmosphere of Venus. 
I think we're going to find there's life in the in the ocean, frozen ocean worlds in the outer solar system, Europa, Ganymede, Enceladus, Titan, uh, maybe even places like Pluto. And uh, uh, I think the universe is is alive now. How it evolves depends on the environment, uh, uh, but uh, you know I have a little different view. I I think we live in a a living universe. Actually, I absolutely agree with you a hundred percent. It's the I don't I don't believe that the way nature works on Earth is different than the nature of the universe. And you know, if we go back to the bread analogy, where you know, if you have just a mixture of flour and water on the counter, yeast, something invisible that we see, yeast actually will come down and will start ferment and create. You know, that's how it was discovered. And I do believe that this same principle applies, but on the universe level, there's all these invisible particles of life in the universe that if they find a place where they can start to have the right conditions, then the, the process of fermentation starts to happen. And then, you know, slowly and gradually you have this living organism. And so I absolutely agree with you that the universe is alive in that same way, uh, but it's just at different scales. So the, the principles of it is the same, but just, you know, different scales. So I guess you agree with that. Well, I, I even would go further and in, in to say that I think we're going to find that, 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 first of all, we don't have a real good idea what life is. As, as I noted, it was, you know, Schrodinger's definition is probably as good as anybody. Uh, but it's uh, uh, that, you know, I think we're going to find that environments that you, we might find processes in plasmas. Uh, I mean, there's ideas that dusty plasmas could form life. I think there'll be different chemistries that can form life. And I think that it'll be very hard to recognize it because it's, uh, uh, it may operate on vastly different timescales. You know, you know, one of my favorite science fiction books was written several decades ago by Robert Forward. And uh, he, uh, a quick synopsis is that humans discover this neutron star approaching, which is a fairly stable neutron star, and they go send a mission and discover there's there's stuff on the surface that's actually life, but it's it's operating in sort of the nuclei of, of heavier metals, and so it operates a million times faster than the than uh, than humans do. And for a brief moment, the two intelligences, you know, interact. Uh, but I think we're going to find that 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 it's very hard to recognize that uh, that uh, what life is. Uh, one of the best definitions that I've found is. Uh, in modern definitions is by Professor Lee Cronin at the University of Glasgow. And he said it's defined by complexity. There's a certain amount of complexity that non-living, you know, matter or chemistry uh, or plasma can do. And at some point, if you see something that's more complex, uh, maybe orders of magnitude more complex, then that by definition is life. Yeah, it's, and I think that's one of the, the, the realities of life that humanity struggles with the complexity of it because we try to we try to create a certain stability but life has a is not meant to be perfect is not meant to be fair because it needs a certain unpredictability and what it creates it constantly creates disruptions so that it can adapt and move forward um and for us we're like no like we need to create that stability but Life is just, life doesn't really care what species is successful at moving forward as long as something is moving forward. And by constantly keeping, you know, the, on every, everybody on toes, on their toes, it just wants to make sure that something is being pushed forward. Um, what do you think about that? Well, you know, absolutely. And I, I guess, I, again, I keep going back to the, that our inability to recognize, you know, life. And, uh, you know, there's a couple interesting points is that it wasn't until a few decades ago that we recognized there were two forms of, of, uh, prokaryote, simple microbes. Uh, we knew about bacteria, but then we found out, uh, uh, th that, uh, uh, there were these whole other, the, the other, other class of, of, of microbes, uh, that archaea. 
uh, and uh, the uh, so we didn't even recognize half the life forms on Earth were something alien. And uh, so I think that that we may even find there's other things on the Earth that are that are that are living as we begin to look at them. Uh, you know, and and of course, then the second part of it is that that this gets into the intelligence question. How would we recognize intelligence? And, and one of the, the kind of experiences I had, you know, about 15 years ago before I had bad arthritis, I used to do mountain bike rides across countries. And I did a mountain bike ride across Costa Rica. And uh, I was with a British group and uh, we were staying kind of in a jungle area in a, in a small, you know, sort of lodge. And uh, of course, the Brits had brought along some gin and uh, and some tonic and we found some, you know, some local citrus. And after a couple of these, uh, you know, that uh, we, we found that the call of nature, you know, emerged. And so I went outside and uh, out in the one of the trees and I all of a sudden noticed there was a creature in the in the trees and it was a tree sloth. And apparently tree sloths about once a week come out of the trees to do the same thing I was doing. And, uh, you know, I looked at this animal and it's going, it, it seems to be going very slowly if you ever watch a tree sloth. And, uh, but you look in the eyes and this, this is a, it's a primate. It's a, you know, quite a, uh, intelligent animal, but you wouldn't have recognized it from, because it, it was, it, and it turns out I later read that, you know, their metabolism is only 5% or so slower, but what if it's 10 times slower or a hundred times, would you even recognize that this was, was, was life, let alone a, a, a fairly sophisticated, you know, intelligent to life and some characteristics. So uh, again, I think we need to open our our uh, our definitions of 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 life and intelligence. Uh, uh, so for all we know, we've detected life elsewhere. It's uh, and, and, you know one of the other things is is that, that we've begun to look at you know there uh, there are places that uh, you know Mars, of course, has been the traditional discussion of, of finding life. Uh, and uh, of course I'm quite excited, you know, I, I'm in a minority here, but I think there's life in the upper atmosphere of Venus. Uh, and it, it's, it's based, I suspect on a different chemistry. Uh, you know, you know, one of the things on the Martian surface is, uh, that, uh, that the, the, the regolith, the soil, half a percent of the soil is perchlorates and perchlorates are highly energetic molecules and there are natural processes that produce it. But my suspicion is that 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 whatever life there was on Mars and there was large scale oceans uh, had uh, you know probably a chlorine excess relative to nitrogen, and so that that we're going to find the life on Mars is is perchlorate energy cycle. In fact, there is life in the Atacama Desert that is based on that. Uh, similarly, I suspect we're going to find you know there are beginning to be evidence of processes in the upper atmosphere of Venus that uh, those are probably based on sulfur and uh, that, uh, that, you know, we keep saying, well, there can't be life there because life as we know it wouldn't survive in that chemistry, but uh, there can be radically different chemistry. So, I, so this is one of the, my objectives in our projects is, is let's open our, our, our apertures for what we look for. I need to put you in touch with Guillermo from humans to Venus, because he actually believes also that Venus is a more, um, first of all, it's a it's another opportunity, but also one that is more closely related to the kind of lifestyle that we have because of the gravity and because of some of the other um, characteristics of that Venus offers. So I'll make I don't know if you know Guillermo, but I'll make the connection if you're um, if you're interested. I'd be happy, 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 happy to chat with him. Well, Venus is interesting because now there's a big argument, did it ever have water, but maybe it didn't need water. Uh, our foundation, uh, you know, funded a major study by Professor Sarah Seeger at uh, MIT that uh, she was in, in a team that, that detected, and there's some argument about whether they really did detect uh, phosphine, which is a, a gas that uh, on Earth is, is always associated with some life process. And, uh, but they did a study that, uh, that showed that there are processes and chemistries that could, uh, could operate. And there's a level in the, the Venusian atmosphere about 50 kilometers above the surface 
where the temperature and pressure is about the same as it here is on the surface. Now, it's in the middle of sulfuric acid clouds, but she showed that ammonia and other processes can stabilize that and that, so that you could potentially get uh, a different kind of life process. So, you know, that's a, I think Venus may be the most exciting place. And, and of course, I'm aware that various folks have talked about where well, you could put a cloud city there, sort of like they did in Star Wars. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, it may turn out to be one of the most interesting places in the solar system. Now, I want to ask you the, I feel that one of the failures of the environmental movement is that, first of all, they created a really bad narrative about the human species. We constantly hear that the human species is a cancer on the planet, we're bad, we judge the past, and how could we do the past? But they also didn't offer a a way to 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 explain or to move forward with growth because growth is an inherent reality of life and we cannot stop growth we can choose how we grow um, i think that part of the past has been to choose more of a linear and growth at the expense of, every, uh, of everything else now there's other models of growth there's i mean the japanese have the yutori uh, concept of growth, which is, you know, has different components. The um, Keith Ra, Ra, uh, Ra uh, Worth now has the donut economic model. Um, do you think that the, well, first of all, do you think that the human species is a bad species or which is the best and the worst of nature? No, I think we are what we are and uh, that uh, we're life and we're by our own definitions, intelligent life, uh, and we're the first species that 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 has the ability to expand into the solar system. You know, I think that uh, you know, I, I go back to my various you know motivations. I, I mentioned the third one that, that you know that Jerry O'Neill started was that we can make life a lot better uh, by by building habitats in space. Uh, in fact, that you know the current adherent for this is Jeff Bezos, uh, who who I've met a few times and, and his view is that, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's build these habitats that could be, you know, tens of billions of people living in them. Uh, and we would preserve the earth for, you know, light industrial activity. And uh, there's sort of unlimited resources in space. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, you know, I know people say, well, you're going to pollute the moon. Well, my point is, if you've been, if you've seen a picture of the moon, it looks like a nuclear war has already occurred there. And uh, so I, I'm not really worried about polluting the moon. Uh, now, I am concerned if we find there's life on Venus or, you know, or in Mars that, that we have to figure out how to, to, to live with that. But the universe is pretty, pretty infinite. So it's, uh, I think that one of the motivations that, 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 that we can make things a lot better. Uh, uh, although I have to say that I, to be a little bit kind of, a, you know, sort of a, a smart aleck is that uh, there was a, uh, when I was a, you know, I think a graduate student, somebody had a bumper sticker that said, save the earth, let's strip mine the other planets first. And, uh, but, but I think there's a little truth to that that says that, that, uh, that you, you have an, an unlimited amount of resources. And, uh, you know that 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 we can we can use those resources to to adjust things. You know, one of the the, the really interesting experiments that was done a few decades ago was the uh, the Biosphere Two project in Arizona, and they had uh, uh, the idea was you could close the, this environment, and and they discovered that that was almost impossible, that uh, that things went wrong. But if you allow just a tiny bit of taking waste out of there and bringing material in, you could adjust this sort of infinitely. If you think of the earth, which is a bigger biosphere, if we, if we are limited to try to adjust everything on just this planet, uh, it's going to be almost impossible. But if we can begin to, to, to adjust a few small things, uh, I think we can, we can, we can make the earth, the, the paradise that, 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 that the environmentalists want to do and preserve it. Uh, the diversity of life and uh, and uh, e expand in an infinite direction. So I think growth is not a bad thing. Growth is a good thing. And, uh, 
you know, being able to engineer things in a, in a, in a much more open system enables us to, to have a lot better environment. I actually wrote about how the sooner that we can mine off the planet, the better it will be. I mean, there's no, there's no debate either taking resources from the Amazon or taking it from a asteroid or from a desert land like the moon. I mean, there's, there's no debate there. Of course, we're going to do it, you know, off the planet. But the other, the other thing that I wrote was about how, you know, if you look at the, the concept of a house, you know, you're, you have your house and you have your backyard and you have plants, but all this is just more for the look because everything that you need, all the input that you need and the output that you do is taken from somewhere else. You're able to export all of the material that you create, the, 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 uh, the, the garbage and the, your sewage, but everything that you need, the energy, the food, all that is taken from somewhere else because if your backyard had to process all this, then it, there would be the the, the power uh, structure, there would be the sewer uh, uh, structure. And the same thing is going to happen with the Earth once we start to go to space, because we will be able to import and export, and the pressure on the Earth are going to be less and less, and Earth is going to be become more like your garden. Now, it's not going to solve everything, but it will definitely give the earth the opportunity, the capacity to become more just of a, of a place that people can enjoy rather than being the source of the, the resources that we need. Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the, you know, I mentioned I'm in Luxembourg and one of the reasons I'm in Luxembourg is, is uh, first of all, it's a beautiful country and, and I fell in love with it a, over a decade ago. But, uh, you know, I am an advisor to the Luxembourg government on space resources and, and their space program. And uh, the, uh, uh, that I think they recognize as a small landlocked country that, just as you said, you have to import and export a, a lot of things and that we can do the same thing as a planet. And uh, uh, we can bring critical resources from space, but we could also, you know, uh, eject things that 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 are too dangerous to, to be here, whether they're nuclear waste or whatever, and uh, you know it has to be done carefully. But it's uh, uh, and and I you know I mean I'm I'm convinced that that global warming and climate change is is an incredibly serious problem, but I think it can be fixed or at least adjusted from space. Uh, you know, and I know this is highly controversial, but one of the things I'm very excited about is what's called solar geoengineering. That you uh, you adjust the uh, amount of energy that comes in the sun, and you can there's a location at the the uh, L1 point between the Earth and the sun that you could build massive sunshades. Uh, and it, people say, well, what if you goof it up? And they say, well, it turns out it's pretty easy to change it. You know, if you're taking too much energy out, you can turn these things off. If too little, you can you can, uh, and, and those would all be built with space resources. And it. Uh, uh, I think in, increasingly we're going to have to do something like that to, to handle the, 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 the horrible climate change problems that we have. And that's an example of using, you know, uh, making it an open system, not a closed system. So you just, you actually, you kind of opened the door for me because I wanted to ask you about Luxembourg. It is a small country, but really important in the space community. I think that there's um, a leadership that the government has recognized, and there's a lot of organizations that are in there. Are you um, are you the one responsible for kind of manipulating the strings behind the country and making them <laughs> away? Well, or, uh, I mean, is, um, <laughs> no, but I can tell you the story how that it, it got started. Uh, I was the director of NASA Ames, and uh, uh, we had a postdoctoral fellow who was uh, an astronomy from Luxembourg, and uh, as I discovered that. Uh, uh, most Luxembourgers like to have really good wine. And uh, so I invited him over to have a good California wine. And he said, well, I should go visit Luxembourg. And I said, for the wine? He said, well, they have very good wine. He said, but the, uh, uh, he said they're interested in starting a space program. And I said, Luxembourg, isn't that that little country between France, so Belgium, and Germany where, you know, you get low-cost uh, fuel and, and booze? He said, yeah, that's it. But uh, he pointed out that in the 80s, Luxembourg had uh, founded SES, which is the, you know, one of the world's largest uh, communication satellite companies. 
And so I came to visit and uh, was really impressed. And of course, it's a small country, 600,000 people. And, uh, you know, I ended up meeting some of the government ministers. Uh, the, the, and the one that I was I hit it off best with was the, the new minister of the economy, Etienne Schneider. And he soon became the deputy prime minister. And, uh, you know, he tells the story a little different. He, I, he, he said, look, we want to work with NASA. Uh, what should we work on? And so I gave a couple things and I mentioned space resources. And he says he thought I was smoking something, but, uh, but I think he, he, he really liked it. So uh, we decided to have a series of workshops with uh, Luxembourg, uh, two in, at, in California and one in uh, Luxembourg. And uh, they decided that, uh, that, that their long range economy depended on new things. And, and, and space mining was, uh, was an initiative. And, and because it's a rich country, uh, relatively, he, he had access to a few hundred million euros. Uh, and so we started a, a space program and, and Jean-Jacques Dardan, the previous director general of ESA and I were the first advisors. Uh, and it and it, it it really worked out quite well. Now I guess they either blame me or credit me uh, with uh, with helping them because they did knight me as a as a Legion of Honor of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, by the way, that in five euros gets you a cup of coffee in Luxembourg. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know I I think the country is. A couple of things. One is it, it, it has a very creative leadership. Uh, they have a long history of, 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 of making decisions like the SES decision. Uh, they, they've also pushed, you know, IT and banking and, and other high tech things. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a small, nimble government. Uh, you know, if you, if you go to the farmer's market in, in Luxembourg here, you'll see the ministers and the prime minister, you know, you're just, and, and you, can, you can get decisions made. Uh, and, and I think that's a, uh, you know, sometimes we look at giant countries like the U.S. or China are going to do space. And I think that in the future, particularly as private sector, that a, that a country like Luxembourg that can pass a law uh, quickly and can make decisions is, 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 going to, is going to lead us into our space future. Um, if people want to know, because I want to be mindful of your time, if people want to know about the work that you do um, for in Luxembourg, but also with the Breakthrough Foundation, the Breakthrough Initiative, I get they go on the website and all the information is there. I assume. Yeah, the the Breakthrough Initiatives has a as a website, and uh, uh, there's a lot of information on that. Uh, we also publish uh, you know articles periodically. Uh, and it, also the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, which is, uh, you know, uh, we're in some sense we're uh, competing with a certain Swedish prize I'm not supposed to mention. Uh, but uh, uh, in Luxembourg, the Luxembourg Space Agency has very extensive uh, uh, information on their website, and, uh, and indeed they're soliciting uh, more companies. And uh, uh, that, you know, I think already it's uh, there's some 70 startups here in Luxembourg. and and a lot more on the way. Uh, they've started a program at the University of Luxembourg for, uh, you know, called the Space Masters program. Uh, they're very exciting. They have a new laboratory, uh, the, the uh, European Space Resources Innovation Center that is very well funded, is joint with the European Space Agency. They have laws that, uh, that, that, that are really friendly towards uh, space of all forms. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I think I would look at look at their website. It's actually quite an exciting uh, program. And yes, the wine is very good in Luxembourg. <laughs> so. I'll make sure. I'll make sure that all the links are in the um, in the description of the uh, of this uh, of this interview. And maybe I'll put. Uh, we'll um, give me your uh, your a couple of favorite wines, and we'll put the the links on uh, for, for those wines also. Well, the, you, Luxembourg is, is best known for its uh, sparkling wine, sparkling. Uh, which. Until the EU got after them, it used to be called Champagne, but it's 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 now it's called Cremant. Cremant, Cremant, yes. You know, I'll shamelessly advertise the one I like best, which is Alice Hartman. Uh, but it's it, it. I think it's it's better and much more affordable than some of the best champagnes. So, uh, come and visit Luxembourg, have some Cremant. Absolutely, we'll do so. 
Are you um, are you planning on being in the um, in the United States this year, or are you going to stay in Europe most, uh, most of the uh, time? Yeah, I spent a, I spent a third of my time in the U.S. We have a, our main office in uh, in uh, uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, uh, but then uh, we're opening. We've just opened an office here in Luxembourg. I'll end up spending two thirds of my time. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, so I, I, you know, sort of split between both places. Well, I'm going to call you Sir Pete. Um, apparently now you're knighted, so I have to, to be formal. Um, well, yeah, interesting enough, they don't <laughs> use that title. The, uh, so I asked the deputy prime minister, I said, what do they call me? And he says, well, it's, it's in French. It's Knight Commander of the, the you know, Legion of Merit of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. And I said, is there a short version of that? I said, no, just put the whole thing on your, on just- your card. All right, the the French people would always make it complicated anyway. So you know they wanted. No, that, a... How's your French? You know, is it good or? Uh, not 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 very good. I mean, the uh, it's interesting. Luxembourg has uh, three official languages: yeah. uh, French, German, and a, a very old Germanic language called Luxembourgish. Uh, but uh, English is spoken everywhere, so it's uh, it's it's kind of a multilingual place. Very very, very cosmopolitan, very international. Pete, it was a pleasure discussing life, the universe. Uh, I feel like we just need a bottle of Cremant and uh, this could go on forever, but we will make That's that. Right. Well, I have some in the US, so if you get to California or you get to Luxembourg, let me know. Absolutely, we'll do so. Thank you so much, Pete. Thank you.